Greetings, welcome to We Are Reading. Thank you for watching. My name is Eli Wananda and We Are Reading is a live stream series, ongoing series, been going for a year now. This is episode number 50, where we read books and articles and essays and other other materials which are from, from authors such as Baba Amos Wilson and Marimba Ani and various others who I think are giving us ideas and concepts and, and uh, philosophy in particular, which, uh, which, are, which are helpful to us as African people, as black people, as we negotiate the situation that we're in in the world and as we kind of try and work out how we can, how we can uh, rise ourselves up uh, from the, the lowly condition that we find ourselves in, in various different parts of the world. So that's what, that's what We Are Reading is all about. Uh, it's, we Are Reading has been described by, uh, by some of my um, supporters as basically a book club where we read books live uh, and you don't even have to have the book yourself. You can just listen to me reading the book live and uh, hopefully you, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy the, the breakdowns that we do, the conversations that we have, the analysis that we, uh, that we bring in our, in our session. So that's the whole purpose of, of, of We Are Reading. We're in the middle of uh, Blueprint for Black Power by Amos N. Wilson. And uh, if, you're, if you're just joining, if it's the first time you're, you're, you're joining this series, the, the, the book is a 800 and something page book published in 1998. And the subtitle of the book gives you a flavor of what it's all about. It's a moral, political, and economic imperative for the 21st century. So loads of, the, the book covers loads of ground. We are now on page 269, I believe, or yeah, something like that. We're in chapter 12. And yeah, we've, we've, we've been reading all about in this chapter about uh, the economic decline of the United States. So the the, the last session, last session we had, a Bob Amos Wilson was was outlining how various other countries had began to take over the United States economically, Japan, uh, European countries, Korea, the South Southeast Asian countries, uh, this, the the Asian tigers as they were called back then before they had a bit of a collapse. And so the purpose of this chapter, I believe, is that Amos, Bubba Amos Wilson is, is, is showing that as the United States collapses economically or as the United States, the fortunes of the United States, the economic fortunes of the United States ebb and, uh, you know, peter away, it, I believe his argument is that so also will the economic prospects of Africans, Africans in America. So... So yeah, I think we, I believe we got up to page 267 by the looks of things. Uh, let's have a look. Was it page 262, 257? No, no, 269, yeah, because we read about NAFTA, North, North American Free Traders Agreement, and we're on page 269. So yeah, we're going to get into that in a second. So shout out to everyone who is viewing and shout out to you in particular, Lao Tzu. Big up yourself. Big up yourself. Always, always good to have you with, with me. Always good to have you on board and, uh, you know, love your insights. As usual, you say, Grand Rising, beautiful ebony people, 24th of March in the year 532 of the Ma'afa. Hopefully everyone knows what Ma'afa means, by the way. Uh, that's a word, a, a Kiswahili term that has been uh, that has been adopted by Africans in the diaspora, in particular, to refer to the uh, the disaster that African people, Black people, have been facing for the last five hundred and certain years, at least. I mean, some would argue that the Ma'afa goes back way, way, way before then, going back to the 90, to the uh, to the Arab incursions, the Islamic invasions into Africa, the, the Arab the Arab slave trade and, and so on, you know, going back to 500 CE, 500 AD, you, you could argue, but 532 uh, refers, uh, actually, what year does that refer to? Is that 15, 16, 14 something? The, so presumably, and you can score me on this, uh, Baba Lao Tzu. Presumably that's referring to the date of the first uh, ship of the enslavers who took our people from uh, across the Atlantic, across the Ethiopic Ocean, Ethiopian Ocean in the 1400s and landed at some place in the in the Western Hemisphere, I guess. So, uh, so yeah, that's the, that's the Ma'afa. 
And uh, you said, Lao Tzu, Claire Daly in the European Parliament declared the butcher Biden Irish ancestors disown him. The same should here. The same should apply to Kamala Harris. Her African ancestors disown her. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose for better or worse, they'll always, be, you know, we'll always be the descendants of our ancestors for better or worse. Um, but yeah, as far as disowning the actions of of, of these two, uh, you know, for shizzle, for sure. Uh but uh, but yeah, here we go. Page two hundred and sixty nine of the uh, blueprint for Black Power. Look out for look out for you know m look out for more more of you guys joining. What I want to just ask as well is that uh, if you haven't already, do join the, uh, the my Telegram group. So I've got a Telegram uh, group. Very you know I barely talk about it, but it's a Telegram group which I'm going to start to use a bit more, just as another means to kind of keep in touch rather than relying on some of these bigger platforms. So if you search Africans Arise Now, or if you search, I think I've changed the title of it now to the Pan African Science Podcast. So search, search for one of those two terms, and you should be able to find the group and uh, just just join the group. That'll be uh, that'll be all good, and then we can keep in touch. I that, you know I'm aiming to share things on there that I don't necessarily share on YouTube and other some of these other platforms. So so that's all good. All right. So let's get into it then. Page 269 of Blueprint for Black Power, and I will uh, I will commence the reading now. So this sub this section is called The Powerlessness of Government to, to Resolve Human Problems. Mm, interesting. Bottom of page 269 going into page 270. Our foregoing analysis speaks to the fact that in order for the United States and global capitalist nations to maintain worldwide military and economic dominance, the, U the US, as the principal capitalistic military economic power, must sustain a constant mobilization to ensure national and international security. We have documented the tremendous monetary costs, i.e. $300 billion plus, and injurious distortion of the domestic economy this global posture generates. Over 65% of research and development geared to military weaponry. And that's a point you made last time around was that while the US was indeed undoubtedly the military superpower of the world, it came at a cost. The cost, one of the main costs being that the economy of the United States was so heavily focused on military development, uh, you know, and on the military that other areas were, were anemic and other countries were exploiting this this. were exploiting this and using it to their advantage to steal a march and to, to get a to get ahead of the United States when it comes to other forms of, you know, economic output. You could talk about, you know, Korea, South Korea and Japan with electro, electric, you know, electrical goods and, you know, TVs, cars, radios, this, that and the other. And that was a point that Bob Amos kind of went into detail last time around. These massive monetary and commercial slash economic distortions effectively determine domestic priorities in ways chiefs of staff are powerless to change. Since national military and economic security are top priorities regardless of who is head of state, regardless of the political composition and orientation of the legislative and judicial branches, and regardless of who, who heads state and local governments, domestic priorities which speak to the basic needs of citizens are reduced in importance. Gerald and Patricia Mis Mischke, Mischke, succinctly define the matter when they contend that, quote, fuller human development and the realization of such higher human values as justice, peace, unity, truth, etc., are restricted and subverted by dominance of security priorities. The Miskies, th those two, however you pronounce that name, list a number of issues which concern people and need priority attention from government. They include hunger, housing. No, this list of things here, you know, if 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 you're going to claim that a particular country or or a particular economic system was meeting the needs of the people and was, you know, was was aimed at, you know, meeting the needs of people, these things would have to be being met for the overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority of people. 
before before there's any you know talk you know going into military this that and the other but here's a list hunger housing healthcare education employment environment war prevention crime prevention care of the aged racial justice women's rights religious freedom penal reform urban planning population population and democratic participation and uh, oh and also prevention of alienation and addiction these are all basic you know human needs and Baba Amos, agree, greetings to you, London Miss 234. Peace, peace, peace. Hope you're well. Hope you're good. Hope life is treating you well and that you're in good health and, and all of that good stuff. Thank you for joining us. Back to Baba Amos. We agree with the Miskis when they suggest that, quote, most political leaders would insist that they personally embrace the above agenda. They, however, are compelled to acknowledge that first priority is given to policies which enhance a nation's ability to survive. Global, uh, sorry, survive global competition. The above priorities are consequently relegated to the back burners of national agendas. In this political context, the Miskis argue, even the best intentioned of national leaders are powerless to move person-centered social justice priorities up from the bottom of their country's agenda, page 271. A review of the above priorities accurately expresses the social concerns of the African-American community. If these priorities are made subservient to national security and international economic competition concerns, then the issues most vital to the survival and enhancement of the African-American community will receive inadequate or no resolution. And this next section is called Demands of Global Capitalism. On Monday, July the 25th, 1994, the New York Times reported that the foreign investment trends we discussed earlier are accelerating. In fact, the Times reported that American companies are once again rapidly expanding their operations, demonstrating that no matter what the incentives for keeping businesses in the U business in the United States, the urge to spread factories, offices, stores and jobs overseas is irresistible. The Times reported that American companies employ 5.4 million abroad, 80% of them in manufacturing. The bulk of the 716.2 billion dollar American companies invested in 1993 was concentrated in manufacturing in Europe, Canada and Japan. The companies also invested substantially in the booming economies of East Asia, especially China, Singapore, and Hong Kong. This was also the case with countries in the Western Hemisphere, especially Canada, Mexico, Argentina, and Bermuda, an offshore enclave for American banking and insurance companies. While manufacturing represents some 40% of American foreign investment, the percentage of investment outlays for retail finance and service facilities rose twice as rapidly as those for manufacturing. And then we have a section called change in the power relations between global capital and labor. Okay, this would be good. This would be interesting. While opening a factory abroad implies or actually means that one in the US may be closed, an equally important ramification of this process is the change in power relations between big capitalists or the financial corporate elite and labor. And in regard to our central concern here, the change in power relations between this elite and the state. That a favorable change in power relations between itself and labor and the state is as important to the financial corporate elite as is the movement of manufacturing, finance, retail, research, and service facilities abroad as means of enhancing profits is implied in a statement reportedly made by Thomas Skelly, a senior vice president in the Gillette Company. When questioned as to why Gillette's new sensor XL razor blade cartridge to be sold in the United States starting this year would not lead to the expansion of its Boston plant where production was started two years ago, thereby creating additional jobs in the United States, rather than adding the, uh, rather than adding the extra capacity to its Berlin plant, Skelly answered, this is on page 272, that we are also concerned about having one place where a product is made. There could be an expansion or labor problems. Uh, sorry, there could be an explosion or labor problems. Interesting, unquote. 
in other words, I think the point is that he's saying, look, we don't we don't want we don't want to just keep expanding our Boston plant because a if there's a there's a single point of failure issue. So a on one hand, there might be some explosion or some you know cataclysmic event there, which would mean that they can't produce any of these razor blades anymore. But he also put into that category labor problems, i.e., these upper T American workers might start to demand better working conditions, higher salaries, and so on. Gillette has put 62 factories in 28 country, countries and what? <clears throat> Okay, Gillette has put 62 factories in 28 countries and employs 2,300 people in the manufacture of razors and blades in the United States and 7,700 abroad. The emphasis we placed on Skelly's reference to labor problems speaks to the fact that by placing manufacturing and other productive facilities abroad, global capitalists are able to neutralize or negate US labor's power to successfully execute its wage and benefit demands on industry by using the labor strike as its most effective tool. Global capitalists are increasingly able to counter labor's attempts in this direction by making up for production losses due to strikes in the US by increased production elsewhere. and through the importation of the relevant products into the US market by other means. More often, they may threaten to close down their American operations in the face of union and labor demands and thereby unemploy their American workers rather than accede to their demands. More often, consequently, the power of global capitalism has been massively increased relative to that of labor due to the fact that global capital can balance its work its foreign labor forces against its domestic workforces. The relative weakness of labor can be gauged by the steep decline in union membership in America and the givebacks unions and workers have been forced to make under the threat of global capital to close factory facilities and lay off or cut domestic workforces. The relative weakness of labor power in America the wholesale transfer of jobs abroad and the relatively low wages paid to workers abroad translate into little employment and benefits protection, joblessness, low wages, and general economic stagnation for the American workforce in general and the African-American workforce and community in particular. And that's a, that's a, a very important point there. What, one of the things that makes me think is, is it underscores the necessity of workers around the world uniting you know it's a bit cliche but basically as long as the workers in different parts of the world are operate are looking out for their own interest interests and only their own interests then of course unions in the philippines are going to be like yeah bring the jobs here it's fine we need we need work here you know even if it means that a bunch of people in America, a bunch of workers in America or the UK or whatever are going to be put out work and they're going to be hungry, you know, they're, they're going to be destitute and so forth and vice versa. Workers in the West, workers in America are going to, for example, talking about immigration, they're going to be against immigration. They're going to want immigration to be cut because they don't want workers coming from overseas coming and, you know, putting a downward pressure on, on salaries. And the capitalists play this game extremely well. They all, you know, this is why capitalists, you know, as much as there's talk, the, the, the capitalists will talk about being against immigration and wanting to cut immigration. They are wholesale in favor of immigration because it brings people from poor countries who, who will be very happy to work for lower salaries and lower wages into, you know, into the metropolis. This is one of the reasons why Brexit has been a bit of an own goal by, by the UK, because, for example, Eastern European workers used to... The, the the farming industry in the UK, the picking industry in the UK, was dominated by Polish workers who would come here and work for very low salaries, picking fruits and so on. And then Brexit happened and a bunch of them basically left. And now the British people don't want to do that work because it's too low salary, the conditions are not great and so on and so forth. So the capitalists are probably going to have to respond to that by increasing salaries or what they're really doing is getting workers from other parts of the world. <laughs> uh so yeah, the, the 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 global kind of dynamics between capital and labor are very you know 
I, I recall some socialist parties in the UK here some years back having campaigns on the lines of British jobs for British workers or something like that, where they openly said, yeah, we, you know, you need to stop bringing in these workers. You need to make sure that we have jobs for British people here. And so that that nationalistic thing, that's where it kind of cuts in. And it goes against, frankly, it well, it can go against the interests of the ruling elite, but they, they're they pretty good at playing it as well for, for, their, for their own purposes. And then uh, the other thing that it made me think of was The Wire. So, you know, the, the TV series The Wire. And uh, if you've seen it, remember that season two, most of the season was about the 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 hood in Baltimore, the black people of, of the, you know working people, working class people in Baltimore. But season two randomly did this detour, and they started focusing on the the white workers, dock workers in Baltimore. You know, a lot of them were Polacks, Polish. And um, what was I only got this the second or third time I watched that series. That's a really powerful series because it talks about the demise of the industry there in Baltimore and how, you know, that's affecting the, 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 those communities in Baltimore. And, you know, it was a really fascinating series when I watch it back again, but um, yeah, that's, that's that anyway. So shout out to you, shout out to you and Michelle. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Michelle, you did change, did you change your, um, your YouTube name? I'm sure I'm sure you were like, something else differently before but yeah shout out to you hope you're good hope you're well and then a question good 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 have you heard of choke point capitalism that's the name of the book high prices low wages creatives not given what they are worth we need to have high wages and low cost of living okay no i've not heard of that book but i will let me put a let me put, a, let me put it let me put that on the screen here and i'll bookmark oh hang on there we go. Yeah, a bookmark that. So there you go. Choke point capitalism. Cool. Thank you for that. I'll check. I'll have a look at that. I'll keep that on the radar. So, so there you go. So yeah, that's that's. Um, although I wasn't sure on. I said, oh yeah. So he's Bob Amos's point in in talking about that is that as global capital, you know, is very fluid, can move jobs here, there, and everywhere, and whatnot. It it's diminishes the power of states because states are by their nature only you know they only have jurisdiction over certain geographical areas and obviously capitalists global you know corporations can just go anywhere you know okay so page two seven one we were on two seven one no we were on two seven two seven two so the next section here is called the change in power relations be between global capital and the state. Did I, hang on, did I read this already? No, yeah, here we go. The ability of global capital to export jobs and displace manufacturing, financial, service, and research facilities not only permits it to oversee federal, state, and local governments by threatening to ship productive facilities abroad and to disinvest in the domestic economy, but also increasingly enables global capital to get the state to generate laws and policies favor favorable to it and unfavorable to labor and the welfare of the citizenry in general. In the name of maintaining a quote unquote favorable investment climate, unquote, i.e. a climate which benefits capital at the expense of labor and other social groups, and in the name of maintaining America's competitive edge in international trade global uh, international trade this is page 273 global capital uses its capacity to increase unemployment by withholding domestic investment by transferring jobs abroad by refusing to fund national state and local debt and thus force the state to reduce its social costs i.e welfare unemployment benefits etc to reduce expenditures for job training, education, health, and other human services, if it deems such costs and expenditures to be against its economic interests. This is happening all over the world and has been happening throughout this so-called neo-colonial, uh, what's the word, sorry? Not neo-colonial, I mean, it is neo-colonial, but it's the neoliberal, neoliberal era, which kind of started in the 1970s, you'd say, you know, mid to late 1970s and was, 
uh, associated with the rise of uh, Thatcher in the United Kingdom in 1979 and then Reagan in the United States in 1980. They were the figureheads of, of, of this movement, which, you know, we're talking, you know, 50 years now nearly. Such reductions fall heaviest on the already overburdened African-American community, and they occur at precisely the times the community needs to not only maintain prior levels of human services, but when these levels need to be increased. The state is now less able to protect the human and civil rights to meet the human and economic, educational and social needs of the American community, African-American com community than it was prior to the 1970s, before the significant globalization of labor and productive facilities empowered global capitalists to neutralize the just demands of domestic labor and the people. At this juncture, even if a progressive African-American were, were elected president of the United States, does Obama fit into that cat, um, profile? Maybe. So even if such a person was elected to become the, uh, president, he or she would ascend to office at the point where it would be least able to positively impact black social problems. In addition to white racism, its old nemesis, the African-American community is now faced with a new nemesis in the form of the negative fallout from the globalization of labor, which will have an impact on the community equal to or greater than that of racism. Whoa. Do you hear that? Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying basically that the the racism is going to be probably usurped in, as far as its negative impact on African Americans by these global, this global globalization, globalism, capital, global capitalism, neoliberalism. This dilemma, the dilemma of having to deal with the detrimental impacts of both racism and globalism simultaneously defines the critical vulnerability of the contemporary African-American and Pan-African communities. It is to this dilemma that this volume speaks. We believe that our proposals for enhancing black power point to its only viable resolution. Okay, good. Really good, really good. Loving, absolutely loving um, Bob Amos's analysis here. So the next section here, shout out to everyone who's joined. Got to see the... the, the the, 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 the session increasing slowly but surely in, in size. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And uh, do do join the, uh, the the Telegram group there, Africans Arise Now, or you can search for the Pan-African Science Podcast as well. Next section is called the Reactionary Outcomes of Global Competition. This is bottom of page 273 going into 274. The reactions of American companies to global economic assaults are bewildering and often frank, frantically revolutionary. <laughs> okay, oh, that's a term you don't normally hear associated with uh, companies, a revolutionary, frantically revolutionary. Let's have a look. Besides reducing their workforces and forcing the remaining workers to take on more jobs and work overtime while earning fewer benefits, in order to increase productivity and cut costs, many firms are now increasingly resorting to the use of contract labor and job temps. And in the US, in the UK, I don't know if you have this in the UK, in the US, but in the UK, there was a whole Ferrari over zero hours contracts, which is basically where you hire staff and there's no guarantee that they're going to have any hours in a given week. Very, very, very flexible workforce that you just call upon whenever you need them, but you just dump them back into this pool of reserve labor when you don't need them. The Wall Street Journal on the 3rd of November, 1993, is that the 3rd of November? No, 11th of, I think it's 11th of March, always the way you Americans do the dates, it's back to front for us, but the 11th of March, 93, describes this trend thusly. This is the 1990s workplace. After spending years at one, one company, more American office and factory employees are getting transplanted overnight to a temporary or subcontracting netherworld. They do the same work at the same desk for less pay and with no health insurance, page 274, or pension benefits. Others are farmed out to an employment agency which puts them on its payroll to save the mother company paperwork and cost. 
The journal goes on to note that temporary help employment grew 10 times faster than overall employment between 1982 and 1990. In 1992, temporary jobs accounted for about two thirds of new private sector jobs. Temporary, temporary contract and part-time workers now compose some 25% of the workforce, and it, that's bound to be quite a bit higher now. In fact, let me just quickly check that because that's, that's an important fact. How much uh, labor force temporary percentage US? Temporary workers. Temporary help employment, temporary jobs accounted for two thirds of, oh, I see. Oh, it's a bit more nuanced than just, so it's temporary, temporary contracts and part-time workers now compose some 25% of the workforce. Uh, anyway, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't find the stat, but I will find it. This phenomenon has led to the coining of names to designate this growing pool of temporary and part-time help, contract and leased employees. Here are some of the names, contingent workers, disposable workers, flexible workers, assignment workers, or throwaway workers. While such changes in workforce permanence, job security guarantees, and designations reflect current recessionary conditions, i.e. there's an extent to which this reality was kind of, specifically because there was a recession at, the, at that time this thing was written, labor market specialists expect that many of the shifts are permanent. The journal on the 16th of March, 93, recently chronicled in detailed an approach to industrial organization it refers to as re-engineering. Re-engineering involves the reconfiguration, redesign and reconstruction of the workplace, the workforce and its procedural organization in ways meant to maximize its efficiency and productivity while simultaneously reducing the number of its personnel. Consequently, it may market, markedly accelerate productivity growth while creating job losses. Some analysts estimate that the re-engineering may wipe out as many as 25 million jobs in, in a private sector economy, which employs approximately 90 million people. The journal quotes John C. Skerritt, managing partner in the financial services group at Anderson Consulting, concerning possible jobs outcomes of re-engineering. And here's the quote. We can see many, many ways jobs will be destroyed, but we can't see where they will be created. This may be the biggest social issue of the next 20 years, unquote. It further quotes John Scully, then chief executive of Apple Computer Inc., who commented that the reorganization of work could prove as massive and wrenching as the Industrial Revolution. Some experts have ventured to estimate that job losses due to re-engineering may amount to between a million and 2.5 million jobs each year for the foreseeable future. These job losses may include millions of service workers, such as clerical workers, supervisors, middle managers, and support workers. I'm pretty sure a lot of us fall into one of those categories. I do, middle manager. Interestingly, the journal reports that layoffs due to re-engineering may hit hardest at the level of middle management, of course, <laughs> whose ranks now constitute 18 to 22% of workers let go. By that count, middle managers are three times as likely to be put out of work by re-engineering. At this juncture, going into 275, page 275, at this juncture, it is apropos to note that compared to overall employment rate, which rose by 21% between 1989 and 1991, unemployment rates for executives, administrators, and managers jumped by 28%, so about, about a quarter higher. The growth rate of managerial occupations is projected to slip to fourth place between now and the year 2005 from its first place position during the 15 years between 1975 and 1990. That's from the State of Black America 1993. Consequently, the Urban League in its 1993 report suggests that, quote, credentials that formerly served management-oriented African-Americans well may no longer assure their economic success, unquote. Mm. And I, I'm sure Baba Amos will, will, will talk about this later, but we also have to bring in here technology and specifically automation, because 
now we're well and truly in the era of artificial intelligence being widespread in society. And with that, I'm seeing in my own day-to-day -day job, with that, you're seeing you're seeing the question, well, do we need people when we can get computers to do what they're doing? You know, so that's 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 just adding whatever, you know, in 10 years' time, it'll be something else, not artificial intelligence, it'll be some other thing. There's always this push under in in modernism, modernity and capitalism, there's always a push basically to make workers redundant. And you know, because because capitalism has placed people in a situation, the whole per point of capitalism is based on wage labor. And it's why is there wage labor? Because people can't survive any other way. People no longer have access to land. They were they were in Europe, they were driven off their land. The, even the white folks were driven off their own lands and forced into the cities to look for late to look for jobs. Obviously, Africans from the you know, Africans from the continent were driven off their land, taken into the taken into the Caribbean and the Americas. Uh, they needed jobs. So we're forced, we, we rely on employment for our livelihood because we no longer have access to our, our God-given, nature-given right to sustenance. And then now even those jobs are being taken away, you know, and we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be grateful for this progress over the last two to 300 years. Thus, the restructuring of the overall American economy and the re-engineering of many of its corporate workplaces translates into job losses by both factory workers and professionals. However, not all the job losses suffered by professionals are due to re-engineering and recession or to foreign competition, but also to the fact that American firms are hiring highly skilled workers abroad for lower pay to perform jobs once reserved for American professionals. And this is an area where, this is an area where uh, I I can see I understand why uh, Barbara Amos Wilson is kind of being claimed somewhat by the uh, the ADOS and the what it was the um, Foundational Black Americans and American Descendants of Slaves FBA and ADOS because Barbara Amos Wilson talked a lot about the impact of immigration and how the immigration was directly impacting negatively the fortunes of African Americans. And of course, these these FBAs and ADOS, you know, they that's their message is that listen, these these people are coming in. Specifically, they're attacking black immigrants, you know, and they're separating themselves from black immigrants. They look, these people are taking our jobs and this, that, and the other, you know. And uh, the problem is, I, I would suggest that the problem is that the ADOS and the FBA are 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 manipulating and distorting the facts in their ideology in the, in their worldview of uh, you know of and their anti their anti black worldview they're they're distorting it but there is that issue does need to be addressed and does need to be really addressed openly and honestly addressed there is an issue of africans coming from the continent being brought in from the continent and obviously you've got the brain drain and all that they're being they're the conditions as they are in the in the caribbean and in africa are such that they're having to leave their countries to go and look for work and then they are coming into the America and they are they are taking jobs which previously African Americans would have taken. And there's also the sort of there, there is that identity issue whereby you know African Americans have for the last several hundred years, you know, the oldest the oldest community in the in the United States, let's put it that way, African Americans. They've gone, they've you guys have gone through all that you've gone through over the last several centuries, and then you've got, you know people like me coming into America and like now I'm African-American and now I'm you know so there's there's definitely issues there it's the same here in the UK as well I talk a lot about the Caribbeans here in the UK African Caribbeans how they established the black community here in the UK and then Johnny come lately he's like myself come in and you know now we're taking over um there's not there's not nearly enough of the kind of deference that there should be toward the Caribbeans who did all the donkey work, the hard work. And then also there is the issue about, you know, not so much in this country, in this country, in the UK, but the, this issue of the economic dynamics of immigration and the fortunes of African-Americans and in, in African uh, Caribbeans here in the UK. So, uh, so there we go. Let's just have a look here. So, um, uh, London Miss 234, he said, a choke point is congestion, blo blockage, bottleneck, and narrowing point. Yeah, now that has to relate into that choke point capitalism. And then Lao Tzu, you said this, 
Um, Ellie, not sure if you have this at grocery stores in the UK. However, here we have self-scan your grocery, which reduces staff. If more of us didn't participate in this technology, it would fail. Yeah. I mean, boy, there is, there's that saying about trying to put the bottle back on, trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And in all honesty, that ship has sailed, man. Like, it, it is... Is it better? I mean, I I usually use the self-service. I'm going to be honest with you. I generally use the self-service, you know, because I don't really want to, I don't really want to queue. Usually the queues are shorter for the self-service. The technology is getting better. I find the technology is getting better and better for the self-service. So whereas before it'd be, you, you know, you start scanning and then it's like error. You have to wait and there'd be like four staff overseeing 10 self-service checkouts. So it was, it was a bit rubbish, like, three two three four years ago but it's getting a lot better now a lot more smoother and then i don't know if you even have this i don't know if you have this where in the uk this has been the case for a couple of years now two three years or more maybe not only can you go to the check can you go to the put all your stuff in the trolley or your bag and then go and scan it all on the thing repeating what the cashiers would be doing now you also have it where you can walk around you get a little scanner thing and you walk around and you and you get your product, whatever the product is. I don't have anything here that could be it. Let's say I'm getting this book. You get the product. Oh, I'll have that. And then you scan it on here. Boop, and then it, it all adds up here. This is all connected here. But, you know, obviously, this is all connected to your, your card, your Tesco's card, your Asda, which is Walmart card or whatever it might be. So it's all, you know, it's all surveillance state. Brilliant surveillance state. They're watching you. Oh, this, oh, he, this Ellie likes to buy... Um, Sun dried tomatoes, mm, interesting. Oh, he likes uh, grass fed butter. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you know, so there's that element, but it's even, you know, it's going to, and, and one of the technologies that they, they also have now is that even all this scanning stuff is just going to go out the window. Instead, you walk into the shops. There are some of these stores that have it in some of the big cities already. You walk into the store and something on your phone or whatever it might be scans you when you come in. And then you don't even have to, you don't have to, you just pick up, pick up products, whatever, whatever, walk out and it all does it automatically and pay, you know, it's all paid for on the system, you know, behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is the problem. It's, yeah, it's, so you, uh, Lao Tzu said, you haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been trialed. There's a few stores that are doing this in the UK here already. I think I think Amazon have some shops that do this. I think there are some supermarkets that do it as well. And it's I get it because the thing is, it makes sense. Who wants to bother to wait? Who you know you want to get it over and done with quickly as possible. But yeah, it is it is unfortunate because it is going to make the role of cashiers and stuff like that obsolete eventually. You know you're going to need a lot less cashiers in a superstore, a supermarket, or what a grocery store, as you call it, then then not. And I get your point, um, Barbara Lao Tzu, you said that if we don't participate, then they'll fail. But honestly, I think they are inevitably going to increase all of these things. And most people will not see the purpose in... I mean, if we organised properly, then, yeah, we could organise together and say, listen, mass disobedience, we're not going to use these things. That could be a thing. But the, then it's going back to the fact that we are such a fragmented and atomized society society by on purpose purposely we've been turned into a very atomized and individualized society where we don't have those networks to be able to come together and plan anything on a social kind of level you know so it's uh it's kind of depressing in, in, in a way but um we we have to work out what we're going to do about that don't we we we, we have to work out a way of of counteracting these things or adapting to the changes. Because, I mean, there's a there's an argument to be made that, do you need all these jobs? Probably not really. The technology is just showing that half the job, a lot of the jobs that exist, you don't really need, actually. We have the technology to not have to bother with half of the jobs that we're doing. Um, David Graeber wrote that book, Bullshit Jobs, you know, to, to make that very point. His, his, his target actually was middle management. He pointed that he was making a point that listen, most middle management are not doing anything of worth. You could get rid of most of them and it wouldn't make any difference. People who are managing managers, for example, you know, why do you need managers of managers? <laughs> so um, you know, it, it ho hopefully what it will, it will do, it will it will encourage more and more people to think outside the box creatively about, well, 
how can we take the technology that exists around us and utilize it to create social structures and economic structures which work for people and are not based just on profit making, profit making, profit making. How can, how can we utilize technology so that people do can live without needing to have a job? People can have access to land, can have access to you know food, clothing, shelter, and so forth. This is you know this goes down the road of like communalism and anarchism and so on, all these kinds of things, which I'm hugely hugely interested in. Although it can you know it anyway so 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 yeah there's a lot there's a lot in there thank you thank you Latsu, for for um for bringing that 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 point up it's very 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 much happening and again african americans i'd imagine are more likely to be in jobs like cashiers and and, and that sort of stuff so yeah it's a problem or it's a problem or so where were we re-engineering uh okay thus the restructuring of oh yeah here we go so they're firing yeah the american firms are firing u.s workers in order to hire uh professionals from from overseas highly skilled workers from asia this is page 275 by the way highly skilled workers from asia the soviet the former soviet bloc and europe are also being employed by american companies to temporarily replace american professionals in america itself for example, the journal reports that companies, namely Texas Instruments Inc., Chase Manhattan Corporation, International Business Machines Corp., and scores of other companies, have contracted with Indians, Israelis, and other foreigners to write computer programs. The importing of foreign professionals, they're hiring abroad by branches of multinational corporations and American runaway companies, the movement of business units abroad, along with hundreds of high paying managerial and research jobs, and the availability of an abundance of low paid professionals in Malaysia, China, uh, Hungary, China, India, and elsewhere, calls into question the idea, popular in the Clinton administration, that US workers can raise their own wages or job press prospects by acquiring more skills. Yeah, there you go. Uh, how many times do you speak to people who are in the Philippines or India when you're ringing your telecom telephone company, for example? <laughs> you know, uh, for, for as much as we can improve our skills and, you know, that sort of stuff here, so can people in other parts of the world. And they'll just always be cheaper to hire because, you know what I mean, they, that's just, they're coming from um, cheap, uh, less expensive parts of the world where it's less, the cost of living is lower. Shout out to you, Shakara. Peace. Peace, Tafadzwa. I hope you're well. Hope you're good, my good brother. Nice to have you on board. Black love, African, African love and unity. So yeah, so this this uh, this hiring of staff from overseas is a, is a, is is all part of this. The journal further notes that the number of applications by American companies that is to bring in foreign professionals has nearly doubled to more than 100,000 annually over the last five years. Many foreign professionals also come to the United States to get training as well as to work alongside Americans during quote unquote peak times, some remaining in the country and others returning to their native lands to find full-time employment in national corporations as well as transplanted US owned production facilities abroad. And then the next section is called uh, the next section is called Social Conflict. So this is page 275, right at the bottom, going into page 276. The scenario outlined above not only speaks to the ensuing drastic economic and industrial changes in America, but also to the possibility of increasingly dangerous political and social upheavals, or at least increasing social political instability and conflict in, in the United States as well. Richard Freeman, a Harvard labor economist, suggests that the current changes in the American industrial sector threatens to bring, quote, a further division in society between those who have long-term jobs and those who lose their jobs. We will see a further increase in the income inequality problem. That's from Bloomberg 1980. Oh, sorry. Bloomberg 1980 speaks directly to this issue when he contends that the United States has entered a period in which growth is no longer an alternative to redistribution. 
As the size of the pie remains relatively constant, a larger slice for one group necessarily means a smaller part slice for everybody else. Okay. So, okay. As economic growth atrophies, i.e. The, the size of the economy is not getting bigger anymore. So because the size of the overall economy is not getting bigger anymore, it means that if the rich are going to be getting richer, the poor have to get poorer, basically. As economic growth atrophies, the only way one class can increase its living standards is at the expense of others. What we shall likely see is not the withering away of the strike, but what used to be called the intensification of the class, if we're, and, and if we may interpolate here, ethnic struggle. Bloomberg cogently argues that the cleavages which already exist in America may deepen as the economy slows, stagnates or shrinks, and scarcity of opportunity increases. Racial conflicts, he predicts, are almost inevitable Inevitable for blacks and other minor. What? Are almost inevitable for blacks and other minor. Okay. Racial conflicts, he predicts, are almost inevitable for blacks and other minorities aspire to mobility at a time of growing scarcity. The technology of taking care of number one may become the predominant theme in American political and economic life. After completing a learned and detailed review of the national and global economic trends, David Swinton, then Dean of the School of Business at Jackson State University, concluded that, to be sure, some African-Americans have advanced. However, the central tendency of the group as a whole has been stagnation or retrogression in absolute status and increased disparities in relative status. The latest data in 1991 and 92 on income, poverty, and labor market status reveal a continuation of the disadvantaged status of blacks. However, for African-Americans, the entire period has been characterized by conditions that would be considered depression level if they were experienced by all Americans. Swinton correctly concludes that, quote, history teaches us that recovery by itself will not resolve the underlying problem of racial inequality. The swings in the black economic status attributable to the stages of the business cycle are only a few percentage points. General, i.e. government policies, will not result in secular improvements for the black population. The African-American com commu community must drastically revise its social e and economic practices and organization if it is to ensure its economic survival. This is on page 277. To greatly expand its economic and political power and achieve its final goal of liberation from oppression. Mm. However, for these things to occur, the African com African American community must not only vastly increase its economic power, but must also implement the economic empowerment of the Pan African community as well. Critical point. Its economic and political alliance with the African motherland is crucial in this respect. The African-American and continental African communities must mutually empower each other if either is to survive happily in the future. An economically strong African continent is necessary for economically, an economically strong Black America and both for an economically strong Pan-African worldwide community. Absolutely. Ashe, absolutely affirm that with, you know, with gusto. And that's where I talked about FBA and ADOS earlier. That's where, you know, Baba Amos and those people part company completely because, you know, Amos Wilson was a Pan-Africanist, was a Gaviai, you know, to the core. And he would have no time for the antics of these people whatsoever, you know. So... Let's keep going. Let's see, might see if we can finish this chapter today, actually. Thank you for everyone who's joined us. Make sure you like the video, by the way. Make sure you uh, please do share as well. And we continue. So, losing ground. This is a, a quite a long section, well, a few pages section now, page 277, and we read. Economic recessions, unemployment, and the concomitant social and economic problems they generate may be caused by any number of factors, including the traditional slowdowns in consumption, saturations or contractions of markets, 
failed governmental policies, competitive conflicts, to name a few. There are some analysts who contend that sometimes recessions are more or less deliberately engineered by a segment of the corporate elite as a means of increasing surplus labor, especially in an economy nearing full employment, which, strength, which strengthens the bargaining power of organized labor. Therefore, by creating a sizable unemployed or underemployed workforce, big capital is positioned to discipline labor by threatening increased layoffs if wage demands, work rules, and other benefits to workers are not held in abeyance or reduced. This, sorry, reduced. If workers do not make certain concessions or provide some givebacks compatible with corporate elite economic interests. Some analysts also argue that recessions often allow for the restructuring by big capital of its production facilities of the market and possibly the economy itself. An obsolete or less efficient, less profitable economic and production system is replaced by a presumably more upgraded efficient, profitable, and productive one. So that's the argument. This is, I've heard these kind of arguments many, many times. This may mean many who are employed under the old economic regime may not be re-employed due to their new obsolescence, i.e. their inability to fit into the new system, or because the new, more efficient, productive system requires fewer workers. And due to the possibility that the new system, even though no longer in recession may restrict employment opportunity rather than expand it, at least for some segments of the population. Page 278 now. While we will not enter into the this interesting argumentative arena on one side or the other, we will contend that recessions, whether accidents of economic nature, the deliberate creations of fiendish big capital or the unintended result of inept governmental policy making sometimes do provide marvelous opportunities for covertly settling some old scores on the part of the powers that be. And the scores to be settled may not be exclusively against organized labor. They may also include old political and or ethnocentric scores against certain unpopular political regimes or certain unpopular political or ethnic groups. Mm. Now, this is a good section. It's called Disaffirmative Action. Wow, yeah, cool. All right. Page, two, page 278, Disaffirmative Action. The 1990 to 1991 recession had all the earmarks of providing an economic cover for the execution of a political and racist vendetta against the African-American workforce and community by the white corporate establishment and white American community. While we are not contending that the recent recession was deliberately fomented for that reason, it was not, it did provide a convenient opportunity for a racist, resentful white American community smarting from being slapped with affirmative action requirements, racial quotas and other equal opportunity employment programs to strike back at the black American community which it believed was the source of its irritations. Forced against its traditional racist will by government edicts and political pressure from the black activist commu community to hire increasing numbers of black Americans at all levels of its industrial and professional establishment, the white corporate establishment and conservative white American community submitted to affirmative action with a vengeance. They would not only increase the hiring of blacks, the original quote unquote minority group and the one with the most valid claims, claims pr for preferential hiring and treatment due, its to, due to its unique history in America shared by no other ethnic or immigrant group save Native Americans, but they would simultaneously increase the hiring of all excluded minority groups and women. This was affirmative action with a vengeance, the introduction of diversity in the workplace. Consequently, Blacks would have to share the prize of equal op employment opportunity and affirmative action programs, which facilitate it, the prizes they rightfully earned after hundreds of years of slavery, of fighting, bleeding, and dying in every American war of racial oppression and exploitation. So they would have to share these things, the, the, the sort of paybacks for, the, for these things, i.e. affirmative action and so diversity hiring and stuff, with white women, 
Asians, Hispanics, ethnic Jews, and ethnic white Americans. And I've heard it said that white women have been the biggest, were and are the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action. Uh, and, and this is what Baba Amos is, uh, is, is speaking to here. Equal opportunity employment, the long fought for holy grail of the black American community, when finally placed within its grasp, would be filled with poisonous hemlock, which it would be forced to drink as a, stat as a salute to its own economic unhealth, a toast to multi-ethnic equality, page 279. In an extensive analysis of the effects of the 1990 to 1991 recession on the employment of blacks, whites, Asians, and Hispanics, the Wall Street Journal on the, in uh, September 93, graphically detailed the egregiously serious erosion of the black American workforce in the corporate American workplace. In a two page spread entitled Losing Ground in latest recession only black, oh, sorry, so the title is Losing Ground in Latest Recession, Only Blacks Suffered Net Employment Loss. It analyzed the reports of 35,242 companies filed with the Equal, Opp Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, covering more than 40 million workers. Its analysis revealed the following facts. So this is, this is showing that, you know, in this era of affirmative action and equal opportunities, African-Americans were big losers, the only losers in this recession. So one, blacks were the only racial group to suffer net job loss during the 1990 to 91 economic downturn. Whites, Hispanics, and Asians meanwhile gained thousands of jobs. Next point, the nation's largest corporations shed black employees at the most disproportionate rate. At Dial Corp, for instance, blacks lost 40, 43.6% of the jobs cut, even though they represented 26.3% of Dial's workforce going back, uh, going into going into the recession. At WR Grace and Co. and IT and T, ITT Corp, blacks lost jobs at more than twice the rate of their company's overall workforce re reductions. And there's a chart on this on page 280 as well. <clears throat> In an analysis of 35,200 42 companies that filed EEOC reports for more than 40 million workers in both 1990 and 1991, the journal found blacks lost a net 59,479 jobs at these businesses during the recession, which officially began in July 1990 and ended in March 1991. Overall, blacks' share of the of jobs at the companies dropped for the first time in nine years, wiping out three years of gains. Black employment at the companies fell in 36 states and in six of the nine major industry, industry groups. By contrast, Asians and Hispanics, who in recent years <coughs> have become more vocal about getting their share of jobs, made both made gains. Asians gained a net 55,000 jobs during the recession and, Hispa and Hispanics a net 60,000 jobs. Whites who outnumber blacks nearly eight to one at these companies gained 71,000 jobs. Black workers were especially hard hit in blue collar jobs, losing nearly one third of the net 180,000 such slots lost. They were the only group to lose surface, service worker positions, dropping 16,000 jobs while businesses added 53,000 new ones. They would, I suppose the question there would be, well, what, what, how many of those new jobs did the blacks gain? Would be a little quibble I'd, I'd add to that. But um, they were the only group to lose sales jobs. And then the bottom of page 279, going, to, going into 280, blacks did show pro some progress in several highly prized white collar job categories. They gained a dis disproportionately high number of managerial, professional, and te technical jobs, but they held such a small percentage of these jobs before the recession began, that their actual gains are meager. Companies added a net 2,700 black managers during the recession, bringing the 1991 number to 249,000, which is just 5.2% of the total for all races. The better educated Asians managed to gain jobs even in states that cut tens of thousands of workers. Overall, Asians gained jobs in mid-size and big business in 39 states, while Blacks lost ground in 36 states, page 281. 
Blacks were hit particularly hard in Florida, losing jobs at EEOC corporations at a rate of more than more than five times that of the overall workforce reduction. They were the only racial group to lose these lose jobs there, as well as in Illinois, where 43% of jobs lost were held by blacks. Gosh, in 1990, they re represented 13% of all workers in the state. Their workforce was devastated in New York, where they lost more than 21,000 of the 91,000 jobs cut in business. And they also got slammed in California, losing more than 11,000 of the 72,000 jobs eliminated, while Asians, while Asians were gaining more than 9,000 positions. Only in three southern states, Alabama, Arkansas, and Louisiana, did blacks add a substantial number of jobs. Many and diverse explanations for these startling statistics were offered by the spokespersons representing the companies involved. A number offered the obviously lame set of excuses that the markedly increased gains by whites, Hispanics, and Asians, in contrast to the marked decline of blacks, was the result of an unexplained sudden demographic, demographic shift a statistical fluke, the unintentional fallout of corporate cutbacks and reorganizations. That we are asked to believe that the capture of a total of 185,000 jobs by whites, Hispanics, and Asians at the same time that blacks lost 59,000 jobs is just a statistical fluke. That we are asked to take it on faith that this, is this in no way indicates the operation of racial bias, besides mocking the limits of our credibility, cred cred Besides mocking the limits of our credulity, adds insult to injury. Even the journal itself, not exactly the paragon of white liberal establishment or a friend of labor, regardless of its color or creed, could not accept the facile explanations offered by corporate spokespersons. That this was the case is indicated in the following excerpts. This is really interesting. I, I wasn't aware that, that, and I imagine this is the same in all recessions, that blacks, tend to suffer the worst in, in these kinds of recessions. So bottom of page 281, going into page 282, we read, yeah, this is from the Wall Street Journal. The losses can, part, can be partly explained by Blacks' relatively low seniority in companies and their heavy concentration in the types of jobs eliminated, yeah. Corporations continuing decisions to abandon inner city offices, factories, or franchise outlets didn't help blacks either. But the demographic change suggests something more fundamental has occurred, a pronounced shift in the way affirmative action operates. Several companies with poor records of retaining blacks say they were mostly concerned with their aggregate minority employment rates and never calculated whether blacks bore a disproportionately, disproportionate share of cutbacks. Thus, they could claim that the government continued progress by they could claim to the government continued progress by minorities as a whole, even as blacks were suffering reversals, in some cases dramatic ones. Black workers had their biggest setbacks as retailers. About half of their losses were in retailing, where blacks lost jobs at a 50% higher rate than the overall workforce. Mm. It's so that I think the argument that Bubba Amos Wilson is saying here is that, well, it, the, the argument he's making is that all of this stuff is not an accident. The fact that African Americans were being so heavily affected by that recession is because because these workers almost were punishing them for them having led the fight to bring in affirmative action in the first place, and they were getting around it by oh, but we're hiring Hispanics and Asians and white women, so. Diversity is great, you know, and that's the danger of uh, EDI, equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion and all these diverse, this diversity um, discourse is that diversity is not specific to any particular group. It's just, we just, you know, we want to have a mix of everyone in here and Africans can very easily get left behind in that. Bob Amos Wilson is, is saying that this was by design by these corporations to punish African-Americans. It's interesting to note that about half of the job losses sustained by blacks were in retailing. This implies that black job losses to whites, Hispanics, and Asians were not primarily due to the imputed paucity of high-tech job skills or high educational qualifications, at least in this area. This implication is sustained by the following revelation by the journal. 
quote, blacks who held jobs involving public contract had an especially rough time during the recession, EEOC records show. They lost 5,823 retail, uh, sorry, sales jobs overall in 1991, for instance, even though companies added a net total of more than 63,000 white, Asian and Hispanic sales workers. There's a continuing problem that white companies will not buy from a black salesman, salesperson, says John Walk, a career consultant and author of Race, Economics and Corporate America. At least one recent study suggests that racism still plays a role in some personnel decisions. In 1990, the Urban Institute sent out teams of black and white job applicants with equal credentials. The man, sorry, the men applied for the same entry level jobs in Chicago and Washington DC within hours of each other. They were the same age, physical size, had identical education and work experience and shared similar personalities. Yet, in almost 20% of the 476 audits, whites advanced further in the hiring process, research has found. The simple answer is prejudice, says Marjorie Turner, a senior researcher at the Urban Institute involved in the study. Clearly, blacks still suffer from, un from unfavorable treatment, unquote. So, but bottom of page 282 going into page 283 now. Some job losses may be attributed to relatively low seniority, the old last hired, first fired syndrome. Whether this explanation, whether this explains a really significant portion of job losses, black job losses, is belied by the experience of black workers like those at USX, where seniority in their favor was disallowed or neutralized by the institution of new work rules or qualifying criteria under reorganization. And here's a quote. At USX, the new rules that allowed blacks advancement in, in the 1970s ended up accelerating their job losses in the 1980s when the company had massive layoffs. That's because of USX's plant-wide labor pool, which allowed blue collar workers who were laid off to bump out of jobs, to bump people out of jobs in other departments if they met qualifications and had seniority. Blacks who could not overcome the seniority hurdles often stumbled when faced with the company's new testing requirements, says Billy Hawkins, chairman of a union grievance committee at USX's plant in Gary, Indiana. Michael Jackson was born there, by the way. Suddenly, blacks with 25 years seniority were being rejected for jobs because they couldn't read rulers, even though rulers weren't even used on the jobs. USX says the stiffer tests were all job related and needed, needed since the steel industry is more technology driven than before. Blacks could no longer get training to qualify for skilled jobs either, as USX eliminated its crafting programs in the mid 1980s because of the ability, availability of unemployed craftsmen. As a result, parts of the plant that were traditionally blacks have started turning white, Mr. Hawkins says. It's really ironic, says Frank Webster, another union representative, Blacks were caught by the very thing that was supposed to protect them. We're seeing the best results of discrimination. We're right back to square one. It's a little bit complicated to get all of that, but um, the general gist of it, I suppose, is, is clear. Back to uh, Baba Amos now, page 283, this is. While corporate downsizing or right-sizing may account for a measurable proportion of black job losses, a proportion that is disproportionate for blacks to begin with, it has been reported by a number of black workers that a disproportionate number of their white counterparts were hired back to take jobs in newly reorganized companies compared to themselves. In fact, the black workers indicated that they were rarely rehired. It is also of interest to consider the possibility, based on suggestive data only, that white women, many of whose entry length of employment is not much longer than black males, or perhaps a bit shorter, have suffered a disproportionately smaller percentage of layoffs. This is certainly the case at some specific corporations. The explanation that demographic shifts are in good part responsible for black job losses in some particular instance, instances may be valid, as the following citation from the journal seems to corroborate. Geography plays a major, major role in black employment patterns. At black at Bank America, blacks did poorly during the recession because of attrition 
combined with the fact that the company expanded in states that have low black populations, such as Arizona and New Mexico, says spokesman Russ Caro. Blacks accounted for 28% of lost jobs, even though they made up just 7% or 8% of the company's workforce before the recession. However, it should be noted that a large part of the demographic shift referred to by the journal are demographic shifts, not of the black population, but of the corporations themselves, shifts to parts of the country where blacks are sparsely located. And it cannot be said that such, such shifts were purely arbitrary or without racial motives, okay? For any current study of demographic shifts will reveal that the movement of some 10 million whites from America's inner cities have not only been to nearly exclusive white suburbs and edge cities, but in rapidly increasing numbers to once underpopulated states like Oregon, Nevada, Wyoming, Colorado, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and the Dakotas, places known to harbor relatively very few blacks. The corporations have led as well as followed the white exodus into the wilderness of the country, leaving severely shrunken or closed operations in the inner cities. Neither the journal nor the company spokespersons they interviewed apparently bothered to discuss the demographic shifts of Asians and Hispanics from away from their native lands to America, where they apparently handily where they are apparently handily competing with black Americans for jobs. Neither did the journal bother to discuss in its analysis the deliberate recruiting of Asians by American corporations where they just happen to be appropriately located and qualified to be recruited under the aegis of equal opportunity. Yeah, equal employment opportunity. So when all is said and done, the following quote by the journal sums it up. Good. I think we need a summary of this bit, don't we? Critics consider many companies' explanations about black job losses hollow excuses designed to hide unspoken bias. Charges Wesley Poriotis, who heads Wesley, Brown & Bartle, one of the oldest minority search firms. There's a deep sourness in corporate America that had to, that had to hire minority professionals. Downsizing has been their first opportunity to strike back. Civil rights advocates argue that under the guise of fairness for all, empl employers can hide differential treatment of blacks. Affirmative action has gotten so diluted that companies can trade one minority against the other, says Eileen Hernandez, who was an EEOC commissioner under President Johnson. Paradoxically, it seems that blacks are fast becoming the ignored minority in the rush of companies to increase the hiring of minorities and diversity in the workforce. And that was always that's always the issue with all of this diversity stuff, isn't it? Is that it is it's, it's just set up for this to always happen. If you're if you go in with a narrative of we need diversity, we need a wider range of workers in the workforce and so on and so forth, that's not that's not something that's specific to you as Africans or, or any particular group. And so, of course, it's going to be possible for, uh, you know, companies and corporations and whatnot to still still play within the boundaries of diversity, but just still to be, you know, still to be anti-Black, basically, anti-Black Americans, still to make sure that they get punished, even while they're even bringing in Black workers from overseas, you know let alone Asians and Hispanics and women and LGBT and, 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 and this sort of stuff. This is the problem with diversity, which is why, you, you know, diversity and inclusion could never be a foundation of black power ever. No, no, no. It's just, 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 it's just impossible because by its very nature, it is a broad church. Diversity is a broad church. So, so this is page 285. Uh, this is a quote from the journal again, I believe. Many companies may not even realize how their black employment shifted during the recession. Personnel executives often focus primarily on minorities' overall progress, in part because that is what the federal government focuses on when it evaluates affirmative action efforts. Even at companies with aggressive diversity programs, such as Dial, black workers can lose ground. Dial says its attorneys carefully reviewed layoff plans for diversity impact before downsizing, before any downsizing took place. But company officials say they assessed the effect on overall minority and female employment rather than on blacks, a Hispanics, or Asians separately. It is interesting to note, as did New York City's The City Sun, 
1993 that despite the fact that the Democrats invented the EEOC and the concept of affirmative action and that blacks overwhelmingly vote Democrat in both local and national elections, Secretary of Labor Robert B. Reich nor any national representatives of the, of the Democratic Party has no response to the Wall Street Journal report, unquote. This was generally true for both the mainstream print and ele electronic media. Despite the racist over and undertones that th thread themselves through the Wall throughout the Wall Street Journal's analysis of black job losses during the 90 to 91 recession, African-Americans must take a good hard objective look at the facts it presents and it its implications regarding their perilous current and future economic status. And this is a quote from that again. General Accounting Office finds greater black job loss. In a study, oh no, this is a separate section now. In a study of job losses during the 1990 to 1991 recession released on September the 16th, 1994, the General Accounting Office found that blacks and Hispanics had a greater chance of losing their jobs during that period than other groups. Blacks and Hispanics had at least a 15% greater chance of losing their jobs than whites. They had a 43% greater chance of job loss than Asians. When they lost jobs, blacks remained unemployed slightly longer than members of other groups and suffered the highest losses in weekly income. Even when blacks found new jobs, their average weekly earnings fell by fell 10% compared to a 5% decline for Hispanics and a 9.5% wage loss for, for whites. Moreover, compared to white workers, blacks suffered a greater long-term loss of health benefits as a result of losing their jobs. Commenting on the GAO study, the Wall Street Journal report, report reports that while more than 50% of blacks had such benefits before they were displaced, only 38% of them had them once they found new jobs. By contrast, 56% of white workers had health benefits before they lost their jobs, and 60% of them had uh, had them upon gaining new jobs. Layoffs were more concentrated among young, less educated workers and in clerical and machine operator jobs. The average age of displaced black and Hispanic workers was 36 and 35 respectively. The average age of for white and Asian displaced workers was 38 and 40 respectively. While 82% of displaced whites and 77% of displaced Asians had high school educations or less, 90% of displaced Blacks and Hispanics had a high school diploma or less. And the last paragraph here for the session today, the discrepancy in job losses between Blacks, Hispanics, uh, Whites and Asians can only be partially explained by differences in age, educational levels and job choices. Quote, Blacks and Hispanics had a greater chance of losing their jobs, even when age, education, gender, and occupation were taken into account. The General Accounting Office concluded in its report. The report acknowledged that racial discrimination may account for some proportion of the difference, even though it claimed there was no way of measuring the measuring, measuring that impact. Actually, let's, should we carry on? Yeah, let's, let's, let's finish. I, I think we can push on through. Let's do this, let's finish. So, taking charge of the economic destiny. It is clear from this analysis and any number of similar ones that the African-American community must become much more self-centered and active in seeing to it that Blacks are hired in rapidly increasing numbers at all levels in corporate America. In, in light of our tenure in America, our social and military sacrifices to its growth, development, security, and greatness, in light of the fact that America, against the will of our ancestors, is our native land, in the sense that we, were, we are born here and can claim no other country and therefore are mystically and historically attached to it, regardless of our traumatically ostracized relationship to it, we should justifiably and loudly demand that we be first in line to receive its benefits. We have not been reparated for our contributions to America, whether ex extorted from or voluntarily shared by us. We have never been the enemy of America in its wars, whether of imperial conquest or in self-defense. And yet we are told that those peoples who not only have not paid the price we have paid to become first-class citizens of America, but many of whom at one time were as enemies are as immigrants allowed to enjoy rights not only equal to our own, but are to 
but are to boast superior privileges. Well, we should not let cries of reverse racism or our own rhetoric regarding racial equality and our sincere commitment to it prevent us from demanding our rightful and proportionate returns on our heavy investment in this nation. We, its foundation, must be determined not to be treated as if we were mere immigrants, page 287. The structural changes going on in the American global economy require that the African-American community not only assesses its vulnerability to economic poor health, but must proactively deal with, their, with this problem aggressively. It must adeptly deal with the fact that its constituents tend to be heavily concentrated in the most expendable jobs. As intimated by the Wall Street Journal, more than half of all black workers held positions in the four job categories where companies made net employment cuts office and clerical, skilled, semi-skilled, and laborers, according to the EEOC records. If this situation is to be rectified before half or more of the black workforce is to be dismissed and, African Amer and the African-American community be economically and socially devastated as a result, then it must rapidly and on a large scale upgrade the educational levels, skills, training, and experience of its workers and future workers. Moreover, it must take charge of its own economic destiny, put its economic and cultural, cultural house in order, and act to actualize its enormous economic and political potential. Capitalism as a system of social relations. As our guide through this economic space, we have chosen the noted economist Robert L. Heilbronner. A, gosh, Norman Thomas Professor of Economics at the New York a new school for social research. Heilbronner, that is a name, isn't it? Heilbronner, it's like, just, goodness me, Heil. Heilbronner seeks to corroborate our earlier contention that an economic system is not one wherein capital or money as capital is merely possessed individually by the members of a community, that an economic system is more fundamentally a social system, a system of organized social relations within a community of persons, yeah. I like that because we have a tendency, many of us have a tendency to compartmentalize economics. As I said this last time, I think, compartmentalize economics as being this like technical thing that's like not really directly to do with society. But, you know, this, this is a very important point that, you know, you can look at an economic system as a social system, a system of organized social relations that, you know, you said it before as well in the last section we read. An economic system is, a way of organizing people in a given area to organize how what things are produced, uh, where how much they cost, how they're distributed, who gets them, who doesn't get them, who makes them, you know, and so on and so forth. An economic system is a, is a fundamental fundamental social system. One of the main fund. If you look, if you think about the human body, I suppose as a bunch of systems: respiratory system, uh, cardiovascular system. Uh, what are the other systems? Nervous system and you know, endocrine system and all that sort of stuff. Same with us with the society. And the economic system is just one of the many system, one of the one of the key fundamental systems in a particular uh, group in a particular area, geographical area. Usually, he argues persuasively that capital is therefore not a material thing but a process. It is moreover a social process, not a physical one. Karl Bronner goes on to argue that money in itself is not capital. Ooh, it is money in use that is capital. Capital is a web of social activities that permit the continuous metamorphosis of MCM, the process of continuous transformation of capital as commodities, followed by a retransformation of capital as commodities into money, uh, sorry, into more capital as more money. He elaborates further bottom of page 287, going into 288. At the center of this process is a social relationship between the owners of money and goods, the monetary embodiments of capital, and the users of these embodiments, who need them to carry on the activity of production on which their own livelihoods depend. The legal crux of this relationship lies in the right of exclusion, a central, although often ignored meaning of property is that owners can legally refuse to allow their possessions to be used by others. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. 
Heilbronner contends that it is the right of the owners of money or capital goods as private property to withhold them from use as their owners see fit. Quote, it is this right that enables the capitalist to, to dominate the sphere of trade and production in which his authority extends, unquote. Cutting to the chase, he outrightly contends that, quote, the idea of capital as a social relationship leads directly to the core of that relationship, i.e. domination, unquote. Readily admitting that power wielded by capital differs in subtle but substantial ways from owners of other aspects of social authority or coercive power, under social conditions that make the withholding of capital an act of critical social consequence, capital can exert its organizing and disciplining influence on the state, individuals and groups in its commercial, social and political interests. More directly to the point, Heilbronner delineates the source of the dominative power of capital and coincidentally, the dominated power of whites over blacks. And this is the quote, the domination of capital hinges on the, on the appearance of a class of workers who are dependent for their livelihood on access to the tools and land that can be legally denied them by their owners. The relationship of domination has two poles. One of them, the social dependency of property-less men and women, without which capital could not exert its organizing influence. And the other, the restless and insatiable drive to accumulate capital. Unquote. Heilbronner further contends that while the possession, possession of substantial capital may or may not confer upon its owners good repute, authority or prestige, it does confer on them the ability to direct and mobilize the activities of society. It also confers on the owners of the goods that constitute wealth an attribute that goes beyond prestige and preeminence. This is power. He rightly contends that wealth is therefore a social category inseparable from power. And he again points to the unadorned social economic base for this power. Per contra, wealth can only come into existence when the right of access of all members of society to an independent livelihood no longer prevails. So the control over this access becomes, a life, becomes of life-giving importance. The corollary is that wealth cannot exist unless there also exists a condition of scarcity, not insufficiency of resources themselves, but insufficiency of means to access to resources, or insufficiency, of me insufficiency of means of access to resources. So that's, that's kind of deep. So wealth can only exist in a situation where the access to resources is scarce. You know, so that's what we have, isn't it? That in the UK, there's enough food to feed everybody, but accessing that food is what's limited. You know, there's a, um, homes is the big one, but I'm very, very interested in, 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 in land and homes and that there are enough homes for everybody in this country to live, you know, comfortably. But a, a lot of those homes are owned by too few people. So the majority of people can't get access to those homes. Or if they want to get access, they have to pay big bucks, which they don't have. So that's the means. Uh, again, wealth can't exist unless there's a condition of scarcity, which is the insufficiency of means of access to resources. As Adam Smith put it, this is on page 289 now, as Adam Smith put it, wherever there is a great property, there is great inequality. For one very rich man, there must also be at least 500 poor. And the, inf the affluence of the rich supposes the de ind indigence of the many. The domination in human society, Heilbronner cogently notes, Baba Amos Wilson likes that word cogently. Cogently points out rather, entails a structured inequality of life conditions that has no parallel in the animal world, unquote. Moreover, he forthrightly reminds us that the insatiable drive to amass wealth, which is probably the most obvious characteristic of, of capitalism and of the capitalist, is inextricable from power and it's and incomprehensible except as a form of power. He says elsewhere that the process of accumulating capital is pursued in part because it is the manner in which the dominant class expresses and renews its social control. He pointedly asserts that capitalism is the regime of capital, the form of rulership we find when power takes the remarkable aspect of the domination by those who control access to the means of production of the great majority who must gain employment. 
It should be an obvious and compelling conclusion that if African Americans and Africans across the diaspora are to achieve their liberation from white domination, whose ruling instrument is the regime of capital, they must either overthrow or subvert white capitalism. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, just give me two seconds, guys. There we go. Right, last uh, last couple of pages here now. Perfect timing. They're just the family's just coming back. So race against time. Where was I? Yeah, it uh yeah, so so if African Americans and Africans across the diaspora are going to be liberated, we must either overthrow or subvert white capitalism, bring it crashing down like Humpty Dumpty, hard to the earth, or masterfully wrest it from the hands of their white masters and vert victoriously fight fire with fire. But before we blare the clarion call of final battle, we must honestly assess our current position, resources and potentialities, and those of our adversaries. For it is from such assessments of it is from such assessments a winning set of strategies and tactics must be derived. All right. A contrarian point of view is the name of this section. This is the two more sections to go. Not all economists agree with the contention that the reconfiguration of the US workforce is primarily due to foreign competition, increased imports, and foreign direct investment trends. Paul Krugman, professor of economics at Stanford University, is one of the most prominent of these. He was, is Paul Krugman the head of the, what's that thing called? What's the America's central bank? I was he the head of that. Anyway, I know that name. In a recent article in the prestigious journal Foreign Policy, summer 1994, titled Europe Jobless, America Penniless, Krugman makes the following argument. Quote, this is going into page 290. Most people who worry about growing earnings disparities in the United States and rising unemployment in Europe blame those trends on international trade. The pressure of global competition in particular from newly industrialized countries with their much lower wage rates, is widely believed to be the fundamental cause of the decline in wages and jobs for the less skilled. That is an understandable view. In principle, it is entirely possible that increased trade with countries teeming with cheap labor could drive down the real wages of less skilled workers in the West. It's also true that trade in general and the manufactured exports of the third world in particular have increased rapidly since the 1970s. From that perspective, the hypothesis that international trade is the heart of the story is highly persuasive. And that's uh, that's interesting because I remember this era, the 90s and going into the noughties, when globalization and, you know, was, was really being attacked. You know, the Seattle, remember the Seattle demonstration? It was all against globalization. It was against, basically kind of against international trade because it was being seen as the source of one of the ills in the world. But Krugman says this. Unfortunately, it is not true. A number of careful studies have come to the conclusion that international trade explains at best only a small fraction of the rise in earnings inequalities in the United States or the employment problems in Europe. The basic point in all these studies is that if international trade reduces an, econom an economy's demand for unskilled labor, it does so by changing the industrial mix. That is, if the United States States responds to growing world economic integration by producing more skill intensive goods like aircraft and fewer goods like garments that employ primarily unskilled workers, the effect will be to raise the demand for skilled workers while reducing it for unskilled and hence to bid up the wages of the former and drive down the wages of the latter. Makes sense. In fact, however, very little of the decline in the relative demand for unskilled labor in Western countries has been due to changes in the mix of goods produced. Instead, employment has shifted noticeably toward skilled employment within each industry, including those non-traded industries accounting for about two thirds of US employment that are largely insulated from international competition. The pervasiveness of the shift towards highly skilled labor suggests that the explanation for growing inequality lies not in international trade, which affects labor demand by changing the mix of industries, but in technological changes that have reduced the demand for the worst paid workers in all industries, unquote. 
At the time of the publication of this volume, i.e. this book, Blueprint for Black Power, the US economy is undergoing a fairly strong economic recovery. Unemployment is declining rather steadily. For many, particularly in the African-American community, this appears to be good news, but appearances can be deceiving. Krugman spoke of the appearance of the current recovery thusly. This is page nine, 290 going into page 291. As this article was being written, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced a sharp fall in the US employment, unemployment rate. Most economists expect that rate to decline even further eventually approaching the 5.5% level generally regarded as full employment. It is also probable, though by no means certain, that within a year or two, recovery will begin in Europe and Japan. As growth accelerates and the number of jobless falls, much of the current despondency over the state of the world economy will surely dissipate. Stories about the jobless recovery will fade from the press to be replaced by upbeat tales of business success. Business success. The optimism that is likely to then to dominate economic commentary will, however, be misguided. Even more misguided than the doom and gloom pessimism that prevails today. The fact is that all of the industrially advanced countries are in deep economic trouble. The irregular rhythm of recessions and recoveries sometimes exaggerates their problems while at other times it masks them. But to anyone who looks behind the business cycle, the disturbing long-term trends are unmistakable. In Europe, in the United States, and increasingly in Japan, it is becoming obvious that something has gone wrong with the promise the, the promise of economic growth. You can maybe say the premise of economic growth. The failure of that promise may be summarized by two words, jobs and wages. For a generation after World War II, the economies of the West offered both, that is, there were jobs for the great bulk of those who wanted them, and those jobs paid wages whose purchasing power rose steadily for just about everyone. Since the 19, early 1970s, however, the economies of North America and Western Europe have not delivered that kind of broad prosperity. In the United States, the problem is essentially one of wages. Most people who seek jobs still get them, but an increasing fraction of our workers receive wages that both they and the rest of us regard as poverty level. In Europe, wages at the bottom have declined less, but in their place, long-term unemployment has consistently risen. On both sides of the Atlantic, there is now a growing sense that many people are in effect economically disenfranchised, shut out of the property prosperity that one might expect in what are still wealthy societies. Ironically, the rise of poverty and unemployment in the Western world over the last 20 years has taken place in a time of spectacular technological progress. The progress has not quite resulted in the productivity growth that one might have imagined, yet the economies of the advanced countries are by any measure substantially richer and more productive than they were in 1970. The economic troubles of the West therefore present a paradox of growing misery in the face of growing wealth. It's a paradox. Now there's this book, there's a guy called Henry George. Was that his name? Henry George? Yeah. I think it was Henry George, who wrote a book called um, Progress and Prosperity, I think it is. Hang on a sec. Henry George. Uh, what's the book called? Pro Progress and Poverty, sorry. Yeah, and he, he talked about that very thing, about why is it that as societies get richer, inequality grows and things get worse? Uh, and then, oh... Uh, and then uh, Michelle, you said uh, the eco the economist this week was really good stories on economics and migrants. Okay, let me bookmark that then. Check that out. Check that out. I should I should read a bit more like current affairs kind of stuff. Um, but thank you. So here we are, bottom of page two nine one, going into two nine two. Krugman sees economic forces as splitting American and European society in two. The society will be composed of those who have good jobs and whose standard of living continues to rise and those who are faced either with falling incomes or the prospect of a more or less permanent life on the dole. Interestingly, Krugman does not see the upgrading of the skills and education of workers as resolving this socially disturbing trend. At least not immediately. While acknowledging that the trend toward growing economic inequalities is likely to reverse itself, he suggests that this reversal may take more than a decade. He notes that 
Quote, the Industrial Revolution created high inequalities in its first half century, but eventually produced a middle class society of unprecedented affluence. The Information Revolution will probably do the same. Unfortunately, the crisis of jobs and wages is here now and will not go away anytime soon, unquote. Krugman suggests that retraining and raising the quality of basic education will not have an impact on labor markets for at least a decade. All right, then the last, last section here, page 292 to 293. The section is called The Economic Future of the African American Community. Whether the reader accepts our earlier general analysis of the changing character of the American workforce, American employment trends and economic in inequalities, or Krugman's analysis, the outcome for the African American community is generally the same, high levels of unemployment and underemployment. Even with the quote unquote full employment, the unemployment rate for the black community will average around 13%. This point is corroborated by an analysis of this matter by economist Andrew F. Brimmer, former head of the Federal Reserve Board, now president of Brimmer & Co, Inc. His analysis, as reported by Black Enterprise in June 1994, in an article entitled, No Real Recovery for Black Jobs or Incomes, includes the following information. The economy is picking up steam. However, economist Andrew F. Brimmer, president of Brimmer & Co, Inc, says that while the progress of Black Americans will improve slightly, the black population and labor force will grow faster than their share of employment and income. As a result, he predicts the jobs and income deficits which blacks suffer will widen further. This year, the black civilian labor force should grow to 14.4 million or 11% of the total workforce versus, okay, 14, but it's, so it's grown from, from 14.1 million to 14.4 million, it's grown from 11% of the total workforce to 11.1%. African American employment, meanwhile, is likely to hit 12.6 million or 10.3% of total employment versus 12.2 million or 10.2% last year. This means that there will be nearly 1 million more black workers in 1994 than there are jobs for them. As the, as the nation's GDP picks up, black unemployment will be slightly lower than last year, but it will stand at 2.27 times that of whites. Black joblessness is project, projected to average 1.83 million in 1994, or 23% of those unemployed, versus 1.89 million, or 21% of those last year. This translates into a black unemployment rate of 12.7% this year year versus 13.4% in 1993. By contrast, the total unemployment in the United States may dip to 6.1% of all, of all, for all workers versus 6.7% and to 5.2% versus 5.9%. On the bright side, if black employment grows, so does black money income. Of course, the parity share of money income should be would be larger if blacks were employed in numbers equal to their share on the civilian labor force. In 1994, total US money income is projected to be 4.17 trillion, and the black share may rise to 320 billion, or 7.7% versus 7.6% the year before. If blacks receive a parity share of income, their share would rise by by 142 uh, billion more this year. Okay, unquote. And the last paragraph, the average unemployment rate for African-American teenagers and young adults is likely to be many times higher than the average rate for blacks as a whole. Many members of the black community will be un uh, who will be employed will be in part-time, will be part-time employees or will be employed at minimum wages. Many will belong to the class of the working poor. This implies that the African-American community must fully and vigorously exercise the few options it has available to itself, to, to it. These options include a more effective push for affirmative action and struggle against racial discrimination in the workforce, a massive increase in the quality of African-American human resources, i.e. increases in the level of job skills, training and education, political agitation for the passage of earned income tax credit, or negative income tax legislation, i.e. the provision of income supports that gradually taper off as income rises, and the increase of black wealth and employment through the economic expansion of the black community, mainly through the ownership of 
business enterprises and equity investments in income earning resources. We shall discuss the latter option throughout the rest of this volume. <clears throat> wow. So, and then there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a chart here, which I think is for the next chapter actually. So yeah, but there we go. That was chapter 12. Oh, a big, big solid read. And I'm glad, uh, well, I'm glad, was, it's good that we got to get through it this time in this chapter. I mean, you know, Robert Amos Wilson's quote from Paul Krugman there, you know, you know, we've got quotes from Karl Marx, Paul Krugman, you know, really wide range of, uh, of, 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 of people that he's, that he's quoting from. And uh, it's a very, very, very thorough book. The next chapter is going to be called, chapter 13 is going to be called The Financial Corporate Elite, The New World Government. That's only five page. That's only five pages, yeah. So next time I will probably do chapter 13 and make a start on chapter 14. Chapter 14 is called Race and Economics. So I want to thank you so much, Asante Sana, for Asanteni Sana, I should say, for, for joining me. Um, we should be back. It should be next Sunday at, at this same time, 10 a.m. in the US. It'll be 3 p.m. in the UK because our clocks go forward next, uh, I think it's next week. So um, love you guys. As, um, I really appreciate your your input and your 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 comments and your, you know, your your ears. And I hope you're enjoying the read and I hope you're I hope you're I hope you're enjoying the, the you know us. And this this journey through this this uh, this enormous enormous book uh, as much as I am this is really good because you know this is the, I've not read a book this long ever actually and I've not read a book this long all the way through ever so it's really good I hope I'm I'm pretty sure it's the same for you guys as well that it's like a disciplined thing where we just gradually slowly over many many months probably this book's probably going to take a total probably a couple of years. To, to, to read all the way through. So much appreciated, enough respect to each and every single one of you. Please get outside into the sun. It is it is very, very sunny here, despite it being kind of cold. I've been having to pull the blinds. Look, look at that, look at this, it's very sunny. So I'm gonna try and get outside now to, you know, get the get the infrared and the sunlight into my, into my eyes and my body. Hope you guys do the same. Take care and see you next time. Kwaherini. <laughs>